Good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. This is Robin Osborne from Michigan State University. My EAB University colleagues are Professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from the Ohio State University Extension. And today we're happy to share with you the presentation entitled The Worst Kind of Snowbird, the Invasive Asian Longhorn Beetle in South Carolina, presented by David Coyle from Clemson University. David is an assistant professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation at Clemson. His extension forestry program focuses on forest and tree health and invasive species management in natural and managed landscapes across the Southeast. Dave's research activities include finding better control methods for invasive plants, evaluating novel bark beetle management strategies, and investigating new Asian longhorn beetle management strategies. Previously, David <clears throat> ran the Southern Regional Extension Forestry, Forest Health, and Invasive Species Program, which provided hands-on training, electronic resources, and other services pertaining to the management of native and invasive forest insects, plants, and diseases to forestry professionals throughout the southern southeastern U.S. We welcome your questions today and comments, so please feel free to type them in the chat pod or the Q&A pod. Dave will be answering them right after his presentation. Tomorrow, you will receive a link to a short voluntary confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us to bring these free educational webinars to you. This email that will be coming to you will also include our presenter's contact information. And for those of you wanting to obtain CEUs, there will be instructions on how to obtain them for participating in this live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. These webinars are made available through a grant from the U.S. Forest Service. Thank you for attending today, everyone. And Dave, you can unmute your microphone and begin your presentation. Thanks, Robin. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well today. Uh, today, we will obviously talk about the Asian longhorn beetle. So we'll give you a rundown of our situation here in South Carolina, a little bit of the backstory of sort of how this happened and, and potentially how it got here, and uh, sort of my, my take on what has transpired in the last couple of years. So I'll give you a lot of Good field identification and solid, uh, solid or solid, I should say, peer-reviewed evidence in some cases. But I also want to make you all aware that I do have a disclaimer, and that is you're going to get some of my opinions. Now I will let you know when it is opinion, but by you know, by golly, I've got a couple of opinions that I am going to throw out here today. So Asian longhorn beetle, Anaplopora glabripedis, it is native to Asia. Hopefully you picked up on that. It's got a very wide host range. We don't see quite the diversity of hosts here in the States as far as what it uses, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And I have eradication efforts down. This is one of those invasive forest pests that can be eradicated. Uh, Identification-wise, is about an inch, inch and a half long, black with white spots, black and white antennae, and it's actually got bluish feet. It's not a typo, they look fairly blue. Now I got my PhD in entomology and I am an entomologist and I'm gonna be honest, when, uh, when we go through our learning and our getting our degrees, you think, man, I hope someday I get to be on the forefront of some great big thing like this, right? This is what we train for. And the thought of it happening can be really exciting. And honestly, when it did happen, it was exciting. This was basically me and this was Stephen Long with our Department of Play and Industry. He was the one that gave me the call that told me, hey, we found Asian longhorn beetle here in South Carolina. And there's a big part of me that was, it was kind of like, this is happening, it's go time, right? But at the same time, uh, I knew enough to know that this was gonna suck and there's gonna be a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulty. And you know, at that point, you pretty much knew that the program I had going at Clemson and kind of how life was going professionally was about to change uh, drastically, drastically. And you know, it's, it's kind of like any of these other big things. You're never really ready for something like this to happen. And this, this happened in May of 20. It was full on COVID, even down here in the deep South, they still believed in COVID at that point. And this was basically what I was doing at that point in May, 2020. 
this is not uh, the picture of a guy who's ready for a great big uh, federally re regulated invasive species to come in. This is a picture of a guy whose kids have been home for three months and he's basically just trying to get by. That said, we don't get the choice and it was found at the end of May 20 at this place right here down in Charleston County, South Carolina. I'm holding one of the first beetles found right there and even that tree in her yard that was riddled with Asian longhorn beetle exit holes and egg niches and damage of all sorts. So where is this? I say Charleston County right down here. This is where our infestation is. It is in Charleston County. It is in a little community called Hollywood, South Carolina. And some folks say, well, Coyle, you get to go to Hollywood for work. It's not, uh, not that Hollywood, folks. It's a very small community. It's uh, kind of right on the edge of the Charleston suburbs. A lot of different land, land uses there. Uh, that is one of the challenges we have is those different land uses. In a broader picture, where is ALB here in the state or in North America? We've got our Carolina population right there. We've still got a population in Ohio. And there's a couple populations up there in the Northeast. So this is where Asian longhorn beetle is at this point that we know in North Carolina. As you might expect, uh, having something like this means you've got a whole bunch of people helping out, a whole lot of groups. So there's a lot of folks on the ground at any one time. USDA APHIS is helping lead the charge with our South Carolina Forestry Commission and Davia Resource Group. They are helping with tree removals and also with some of the research happening down there. Clemson uh, Regulatory Services and then our College of Ag and also our Cooperative Extension. We have a very heavy presence in this area and we're collaborating with North Carolina State University on some of the research as well. So there's a lot of groups pretty much all the time, uh, a lot of different hats you see walking around down there. And I will say at this point, you know, everyone in the region in the area has been very receptive. I think we've had a very successful um, communications program and that has made it very, very easy working down there for the most part. Now in South Carolina, you know, if you're an entomologist, Asian longhorn beetle sticks out, it's pretty obvious, pretty easy to see, but to most residents, any great big beetle looking thing could be confused for Asian longhorn beetle. And here in South Carolina, four of the main culprits, uh, the, one of the big ones is that Eastern eyed click beetle. You can see that on the left picture there. Uh, we also have cottonwood borers. Now these are, you know, I think of Asian longhorn beetle as a black beetle with white spots. Cottonwood borer is more of a white beetle with black spots. Those are not very common either. And then we do have a lot of monocamus. There are pines all over the all over the place, and those pine sawyer beetles are quite common. So they can be confused. And even within Asian longhorn beetle, there's a lot of morphological variation. These four insects are all Asian longhorn beetles. Very likely two females on the right two males on the left, but you can see there's a, a big difference in how large an adult beetle can get to be. When it comes to damage, we're seeing a lots of heavy damage down here and it's almost all on red maples, but you see the adults are doing your very standard egg niche chewing. They will sit there on the tree and she will chew a little divot into that bark. Uh, she will turn around and put an egg in there. And in some cases those Niches can be just, you know, up and down the tree, almost in rows. The eggs are laid inside those uh, right in the middle there. And then as the eggs hatch, those first instars start feeding on the phloem. And this feeding generally causes those trees, and it's mostly red maples, causes these trees to bleed sap. And that sap comes out as black. And it results in this black streaking down the trunk of these uh, light barked maple trees. From my perspective, this is one of the easiest times to see larvae. This, this happens predominantly in June, early July. Uh, it's just really easy to see these black streaks going down the trunk of these trees, and, and they can be quite, uh, quite numerous in some cases. As that larva feeds and gets a little bigger, eventually it turns and burrows, uh, chews its way straight into the wood of the tree, the stem of the branch, and then it starts kicking out this uh, sawdust or these wood shavings. These things get all over the place. They fall on vegetation below, they get caught in a lot of the cobwebs. Uh, in some cases, as you see on the right there, they get pushed out almost like a, a little noodle. So this is the older larva is feeding inside there. 
pushing its way through. And this is really where the bulk of the damage from Asian longhorn beetle comes is from that larval feeding. Here's a cross section of one of the stems. And you can see these larvae are not small. They can be you know, almost as big as someone's pinky. And they just kind of motor their way through there and swish cheese the inside of that wood. So this doesn't really result in a rapid death of that tree, but it, it does a couple things. The first major thing is it completely degrades the structural integrity of that stem or of that branch. Uh, obviously, it's not as strong of a thing if you've got a bunch of you know, nickel to quarter size holes going through it. But secondly, it really messes with the water flow. So the trees that are heavily hit down here, they tend to just sort of fall apart. So you'll see branches breaking off, tops breaking off. The tree kind of stays alive. It sends up those epicormic shoots and then eventually it just sort of peters out and dies at that point. This is a, I opened up the bark on one of those trees to sort of show, you know, the time timeline and the anatomy of a, a attack, so to speak. So right about here is probably where that adult female oviposited that egg and the larva, the egg hatched and that larva started feeding on this phloem. And if you look really carefully, there's a dark spot right there. That's where the larva turned and started going into the wood. The larva fed in this general region. That's where it did that uh, Swiss cheesing. And then uh, came out here in this little exit hole, which is a very common uh, thing. They make this round exit hole. It's a good diagnostic characteristic because you can generally stick a pencil in there. And because the exit hole goes in an inch or so deep, the pencil just sort of sticks. So it's a really good indicator that you may have Asian longhorn beetle. We talked about that feeding and the structural damage it does. You get lots of broken and falling branches in areas where you've had a lot of this Asian longhorn beetle damage. Here is this, so this is a, you know, a stem or a branch that fell and this is me picking up the end of it. So you can see my hand uh, on the left for size reference. And then on the right, here's all the different larval holes that had been tunneled through that stem. It's very easy to see how this thing would just snap off uh, because you know half the, the wood is basically gone. And in these stands, there's lots of hanging things, widow makers, they are called in forestry. And it's just, uh, you know, it's a little unsettling in some cases. It certainly limits where we can do some of our research. We're not going to have our folks tromping around in there when there's big branches just sort of caught up above overhead. And even the ones that fall, you can generally find, you know, they usually break just a few inches below one of those exit holes because that's the area in which those larva, larvae are doing all their feeding. Here is an egg niche and an exit hole pretty much next to each other. They are roughly the same size. Uh, the niches are just a shade larger. And then adults do feed. Some of them feed, I should say. They tend to eat that uh, tender green bark on some of those epicormic shoots. Um, not all adults feed though, so that is one thing to keep in mind. The feeding from the adults, you know, results in negligible damage to that tree, uh, but it is that larval feeding that does all the main damage. From a management perspective, uh, you know, prevention and safety, those are kind of the two things we look for. Can you prevent damage? I have maybe. I mean, you can put, um, you know, there's, there's emmectin, benzoate, and there's some of these other injectable uh, chemicals you can put in trees, they do not work all that well. Uh, 50 to 60 percent is I believe the figure I've read and have seen. Uh, part of that reason is adults aren't really feeding and the larvae are not feeding on the phloem all much. You know, they eat phloem for a couple of weeks maybe and then they turn and they start feeding on wood. And once you're in the wood, those, uh, those injectable chemicals are not going, to, not going to do anything. Can you save a tree once it has Asian longhorn beetle? The short answer is no, because this is a federally regulated pest. That means if it is found, that tree is coming down. So the current situation here in South Carolina, we've got just over 76 square miles of a quarantine zone. Uh, on that map, Charleston is just off to the right. Uh, we've surveyed almost 88,000 trees, about 5,600 or so are infested. Removal started in November of 20, and you know we've removed almost 5,300 trees. So we're doing pretty, pretty well. Uh, or, I'm sorry, almost 3,200 trees have been removed, 2,100 of those uh, high risk also. So we're doing pretty well, we're making good headway here. 
So what does Asian longhorn beetle eat other than trees? What kind of trees? It's almost all maple. Uh, it is also, we're seeing some attacks on cottonwood, willow, elm, sycamore, and birch, but those are, you know, 2% uh, at most. We detailed a little bit of this in a paper we put out last year. Uh, it just sort of, it, it breaks it down a little more by species. The predominant species we have down here is red maple, and that is most of what it is eating. It is hitting some of those other things, mostly in people's yards, where a lot of the maples have already been hit pretty heavily. The next question we get all the time is, how did Asian longhorn beetle get here? Uh, we did some genetic tests. APHIS did some genetic testing back in uh, 2000, and they found that the population in South Carolina matches the population in Ohio. Now, this was back in 2000, so at the time, I just assumed it was probably a spiteful Ohio State fan because, uh, you know, Ohio State hadn't beat Clemson in football yet. Uh, those of you that follow football know it finally happened uh, just last year. They finally beat us. Good for Ohio State. Full disclosure, I am a Wisconsin Badger fan, so this explains some of this rhetoric. That said, we cannot fully blame Ohio State people. We can also consider the fact that Asian longhorn beetle may have gotten here from its native range. Right? It is known to uh, live in China and some other areas over there in, in Asia. It very well may have came, come here in the same manner as it got to other places. It also could be from Europe. You know, Europe has a lot of Asian longhorn beetle populations, and it's perfectly plausible that the beetle went from China to Europe over here to South Carolina. Now, when you look at the whole uh, environment around where we have this particular infestation, it really does check almost every box you can think of for potential ways an invasive wood boring pest could get here. We have two large ports within 90 miles. The Port of Charleston is not even 20 miles away. And the Port of Savannah is about 90 miles away. And that may seem like a long ways, but Port of Savannah is, I believe, the second largest uh, container port in at least along the East Coast. There's a ridiculous volume of stuff that comes in there every single day. And a lot of that stuff has solid wood packing material. It is totally plausible that something could come through Savannah. There's also an RV park right in the center of the infestation zone. It's almost like you can't make this up. Everything just sort of fits. So you've got this RV park. And I can tell you from experience, there, it doesn't matter how expensive someone's RV is. Uh, it could be a quarter million dollars. You'll have people that will carry 40 bucks worth of firewood with them halfway across the country to save a few dollars. So we see firewood being transported quite a bit. There's also a railroad that goes right through the infestation zone. And this zone is right on Highway 17, which is a major state highway in South Carolina that connects places like Myrtle Beach to Charleston to Hilton Head to Savannah on down to Jacksonville. It is a very, very heavily traveled road. The College of Charleston is a, a small college right there in Charleston, and they have done some work on tourism. We know that visitors from Ohio are consistently in the top 10 as far as, you know, number of visitors from each state that comes here. Ohio is usually about number seven as far as where they stand in the ranking. So long story short, we don't know the origin, right? It could be any one of these different ways. That being said, Occam's razor, the most simple explanation is likely the correct one. It was very likely in my professional opinion that it got down here on firewood from Ohio. I don't think it was on purpose. I think someone just brought it down uh, and that's how we got it here. Um, we know that this has been here about seven, well, eight years now, because when they did some of those uh, early genetic tests, we also looked at some of those first trees we found and some of the oldest uh, exit holes were from the year 2013. So this thing has been here a long time, seven years before we actually found it. Um, it's good to know that you know, if there's a silver lining there, it's that this pest had been here seven years and really hasn't moved a whole heck of a lot. Uh, on the other side of that is the fact that this pest was here seven years and nobody knew a thing about it. So that's, that's something we're working on as well. So what is our prognosis with this infestation? 
Well, I like to look at things on this invasion curve, and this is a very standard uh, thing we have in invasive species biology. It sort of looks at uh, the, the, the way an invasive pest comes in and what happens over time. So you've got time on the, on the bottom on the X factor. As you go right and more time has passed, on the y-axis going up, you have the amount of area infested. And then on the other side there, you get the control costs. So at some point, way down there in the lower left corner, every invasive pest we have gets introduced. Uh, maybe it's one of them, maybe it's a group of, group of them. They come to this country. And typically, it takes a little while between when they are introduced and when they are actually detected. It's not because we're not looking, it's just that it's extremely hard almost impossible to find the very first anything that gets somewhere, right? There's just too much vast open space, too many possibilities. So some time has to pass, the population has to increase a little bit, and then it is generally detected. Now, even at that point, it's still possible in most cases to eradicate this particular pest. But as time goes on and those populations grow, eradication becomes less and less likely. And usually by the time there's a lot of public awareness, you've got to the point where you're not going to eradicate this pest and you're really just looking at managing it at a local level. Maybe that's at a park, you know, in a particular park, on someone's property, at a particular management area. That's kind of where you are. This is your standard invasion curve. Now, Asian longhorn beetle is a little bit different. Uh, we found it, okay, in 2013 in South Carolina, again, detected it in 2020. The difference though is because we already knew what Asian longhorn beetle was because we have had this pest in North America for over 20 years. We were able to start that public awareness campaign immediately. Um, and, and we also know that because of the biology of this pest, it's a different, different thing. We've got a chance to get rid of it. Again, the green spots here on this map are places where it has been eradicated. Chicago eradicated. Two spots in Ohio eradicated. A whole host of spots up in the Northeast have been eradicated. And this isn't even showing the spot uh, up around Toronto that was also snuffed out. So the good news is, yes, we can totally eradicate Asian longhorn beetle. And we have already started that. I mentioned that a bunch of trees have already been removed. Uh, this pest can be eradicated, and we are working to do that. So what now? We've got all these different partners here working uh, to try to get a handle on this infestation. The regulatory folks, so this is primarily uh, USDA APHIS and uh, Clemson DPI, our Department of Plant Industry. For a lot of states, this is stuff the Department of State Department of Ag does. South Carolina is just structured a little differently in that our Department of Plant Industry is within the Clemson umbrella, but that is our regulatory agency. They are working to, you know, keep up the quarantine. They're working a lot of the behind the scenes things. We're trying to figure out exactly where trees are infested. They're doing a lot, uh, almost all of the tree surveys, that type of thing. And they have set up, you know, a website where if you want to go see where this stuff is, you can go to this website, clemson.edu slash public slash ALB. Uh, it will show you the quarantine. There's an interactive map so you can zoom in and zoom out and see exactly where that quarantine is. And that quarantine simply means that you cannot bring certain materials out or beyond the edge of that, uh, of that line. And this is material like firewood, uh, you know, live maple plants, uh, some of these things, any type of beetle, obviously you can't catch the beetles and bring them with you. Uh, so it's just, it's a way to make sure that stuff is not getting outside of where we have uh, our resources. From the extension perspective, and this is handled mostly by me and our, our Clemson Extension teams and the Forestry Commission and APHIS as well to an extent, we just communicate, and I mentioned earlier that we had a really, we've had a really good experience working with our local uh, folks here. And we just, you know, we've sort of kept up the, the mantra that we just need to keep everyone really informed about what's happening. We worked really hard, you know, I got that call on a Friday back in May of 20. I spent the whole weekend and the Monday 
getting all of our materials together, working with APHIS, working with DPI, so that when the information went public on the Tuesday, all of our stuff was up and ready. And since then, we have put a really, really high premium on making sure we are present in the area, making sure we are talking to people, having things to hand out, having the flyers, having the, the magnets, and having, you know, koozies to hand out. We've done a really, really good job, and we've put a lot of effort into the PR side of this whole thing. And I think that has helped us a lot because... When you come to someone's property and tell them you need to cut three of their trees down in the front yard, that is bad news for, for almost anybody. Uh, but the fact that we've been able to do that and meet very, very little resistance, uh, I think is a, a testament to how well we've done the communication. We've been in the TV, we've been in newspaper, we've been on radio, we've been putting out videos. All of this helps keep people aware of why there are these great big trucks everywhere, why they're cutting trees down, and why they see people in, you know, orange shirts and APHIS, APHIS outfits walking all over the place. Then for research, this is a brand new area for us in which we have found uh, Asian longhorn beetle. And there's a lot of different challenges to managing it down here. There's some obvious differences from, you know, our South Carolina infestation to the Ohio one, which is the next closest. The biggest one being, uh, there's no winter here, okay? Uh, so let's start first. When this first happened, we had the question, well, let's set up some traps. You know, we've been trying to trap this thing for a long time, uh, the adult traps. We had really high populations. Let's trap beetles and try and monitor these populations using the latest and greatest trapping technology. That, that didn't work in any way, shape, or form. So we are walking away from trapping at this point. Um, you know, I trapped for 10 weeks, 45 traps, uh, caught a total of two adult beetles. One of them was in a control trap, so it just basically got lost. Um, it just simply did not work. And then the big question now, why, right? Why does this not work? And I know people have been trying to trap this beetle for, you know, 20 plus years, and these are very smart people who have been trying to make this happen, and it just hasn't worked yet. And this is what I think at this point. ALB uses multiple senses to find a mate. So it uses those olfactory senses, visual senses, and tactile. Something like the southern pine beetle, which we can trap very, very well. We, we, the southern pine beetle is common throughout the whole southeastern U.S., heck, up in the northeast at this point. But we can trap this, you know, you can set SPB traps out and have a bunch of them in an hour. And it's because they primarily communicate with olfactory signals. And because of that, we can make that pheromone that attracts them. We can put it in a pouch and set it out there and it will slowly release it, um, you know, like, like it would naturally and you'd catch a bunch of these things, fairly straightforward. Take something like emerald ash borer, which is more difficult to trap, but still the traps kind of work, you know? <clears throat> and they're a little more difficult because they got two things going on primarily. There's some visual cues and there's olfactory cues. So you've got, you know, you've got the lure, you've got the, the way the trap works. It's hard, but it still works. Asian longhorn beetle, on the other hand, kind of needs all three of these things to work. And we just simply haven't found an effective way to trap these things yet. It is my belief that this is just, it's just not going to work barring some major breakthrough. And, and personally, I think there's probably better things that the effort can be spent on at this point. Moving on. The climate, and this is one of the things that I alluded to, we don't have a winter down here. So how does this really impact ALB phenology? Frankly, we don't know yet. Now we do have an ALB phenology map created by Kaplan et al. a few years back. And uh, one of my grad students, Ms. Elena Schmidt, she is working on this as we speak. She's been trapping, I shouldn't say trapping, collecting larvae every month since August, and she'll continue this for probably another year. She is going to look at what stages are present in each month and then try to update this map. And if you look on this map, uh, right here is where Hollywood, South Carolina is. You can see uh, based, on the, uh, based on the map here, 0.59 to one years to maturity. So you're looking at seven to 12 months uh, maturity uh, from egg to adult for an Asian longhorn beetle. If this is true, that is significant because this could push it from beyond a one generation per year thing to potentially kicking out, you know, one and a half or maybe two. And I mentioned it doesn't, 
we don't have a winter. Nothing, the hard freezes are few and far between. Frosts are a big deal. And uh, it really doesn't get all that cool down here. This year's a little different. We had some cool weather, cool for us being in 40s at this point, right? So uh, I know all you Northern folk are thinking that is not cool, but look, for people down here, that is a uh, North Face jacket weather. I won't kid you. So uh, Lena is working on these monthly larval collections. She's collecting every life stage. That'll be larvae, pupae, eggs, you name it, adults. Uh, very straightforward, cutting trees down, picking them apart and seeing what's in there. And then she's been working on this with Dr. Talbot Trotter, the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, we're going to upgrade that model and hopefully get some new data in there and get better forecasting for what we can expect. Next question is how do these populations expand on the landscape or within a tree? One of the benefits of having a pest that you can eradicate is the minute it's found, a boatload of resources go and they start cutting trees relatively quickly. And this is good because this is how we can get this thing under control. On the other hand, from a purely research perspective, when you're asking about knowing some of that basic biology when it comes to how fast do they develop? How fast do they move? Often these things are not able to be obtained because the populations crash uh, so, so quickly. Um, so we don't really know what, what's the answer to these things. How do they move at what rate? What makes them jump from one tree to another tree? And from a population biology perspective, what you really need is an isolated population. You know, it would be great if you had a population that was just on an island that had used most of the resources there, but not all of them. Hey, what do you know? Clever segue. We have an island down here that had a population of Asian longhorn beetle. Some of the hosts were attacked, some were not. It was the perfect situation. It's also not a bad place to do research. So here it is at the end of the boardwalk. Uh, this project is being led by Meredith Bean. So she went and we worked with Davey and we worked with APHIS, DPI, and there were a total of 36 red maple trees out here with heavy light or uninfested uh, or heavy or light infestation levels or some that were uninfested. We worked with Davey to physically move every single one of those trees in their entirety. This is what you get. So she took every one of those trees off. It took us about a month to do this. And then she more or less put them back together, almost like you would reassemble a dinosaur skeleton. She's got all these trees georeferenced on site. She's got all the parts labeled appropriately. So she can tell what exit hole and what egg niche came from what part of which tree. From that, she's getting all sorts of data when you look at the uh, number of egg niches, the number of exit holes. And you know the exit holes are fascinating because they're, the tree will heal these a lot of the time. And that's another thing to think about is because we have such a long growing season down here, our maple trees and a lot of our hardwoods only have about two months where they don't have leaves on them. You know, they'll have leaves into October, early November sometimes. And they've, you know, they were, red maples were flowering two, three, like three weeks or a month ago already. Uh, everything is very fast. So here's some of these exit holes. You can see a fresh one on top all the way to one that's practically healed over on the bottom. So what she can do is she can cut right through almost the middle of that exit hole, you sand that down and then she can do dendrochronology and she can count those rings and determine what year that beetle came out of that tree. Using these data and using some of the spatial stuff, we can see where the hotspot was on that island. We can determine how they moved within a tree and we can determine how they moved from tree to tree. She will be done with her stuff at the end of summer, so we hope to have a, a lot better handle on how these things move and maybe what, uh, what causes them to move here really soon. Another question is how do we eradicate ALB in those ecologically sensitive or difficult to access areas? Um, you know, up north, it, it's fairly simple. You just cut the trees down and chip them up. And if there's a wet area, you can wait till it freezes and go do that at that point. Well, there's a lot of really wet areas down here that just simply don't freeze. There's no way you're gonna get some of this heavy machinery in here and there, we just flat out need different things that we can do for this. Here's an example. This is one of the infested areas. Every one of those yellow X's is a red maple that needs to be removed. 
So uh, short of physically walking in there and dragging every tree out, we don't have a lot we can do at this point. And as cliche and stereotypical as it sounds, we do have some critters down here that are not found in those more northern areas. We've got uh, some venomous snakes, some of which like the copperheads here, those are just flat out angry most of the time. And then there are alligators in some of these areas too. And by and large, alligators are not that aggressive except when they're protecting nests, in which case they are quite aggressive. So all of these things have to be worked around uh, for the survey crews and then also accounted for when we start doing the removals. So our plan B, our management alternatives, we're working with Dr. Kelly Oten holding the chainsaw there. She's at NC State. And then Abby Ratcliffe, she's our graduate student. We're looking at different things we can do to eliminate these trees uh, in these areas. And the thinking is because it is so warm, because it is so humid, and because those conditions are so good for fungi and decomposing uh, you know, invertebrate communities, the whole thought is, will the decomposer community work faster than the Asian longhorn beetle larva and you know, degrade that tree to a point where anything in it won't really survive? So we did three different methods uh, of management. We call it hack and squirt, drop and leave, drop and chop. And again, we are just trying to see if there's going to be some other option rather than complete host removal. One other thing that I neglected to, to mention that's on here is, you know, some of these areas, water comes and goes. Uh, and one of Abby's study sites, we were there in May, and it was just a little muddy. We were there in August, and the water was thigh high. We were there in February, and it was dry. So it's very, very ephemeral with some of this water. So here's one of Abby's treatments, hack and squirt. This is where you just take a herbicide, glyphosate, or triclopyr, hack into the living tissue there and squirt that, and that will kill the tree top and bottom. Our drop and leave is where we simply cut the tree down and let it lay on the ground and then drop and chop. We cut it down and we cut these up into about four foot sections. We come back quarterly to check uh, and Abby takes everything back and does kind of the same thing Lena does. She picks through all these parts, takes out all the uh, ALB larvae or life stages and she's getting all the other stuff as well. We're also assessing uh, how many ambrosia beetles come to these, uh, these logs because they're very significant when it comes to the decomposer. And then, um, you know, one thing we're not really looking too much at was the type of fungi that are in there. But I can tell you there's all sorts of stuff going on once you cut these trees and they start laying on the ground. Uh, the decomposer community is aggressive and fast and varied. So you've got all sorts of uh, beetles that come in there, all sorts of fungi that are attacking these things. Ambrosia beetles are all over the place. You can see some of the uh, little um, frass tubes here. Lots and lots of decomposition. This is something we're really excited about because we're, we're very optimistic some of this stuff is going to work. In a project we just started, we're going to start looking at bi potential biocontrol for Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, Marina Lupu is a new graduate student with me, and she just started in January. We are going to be surveying for potential parasitoids down there in Charleston. We are also going to use uh, sentinel trees uh, with charged with ALB larvae and put those out there to see if we can bait in any of these parasitoids. Uh, they've had some good luck with a, a native parasitoid on Cyrum uh, in some of the lab work. So we're going to try to see if this is going to be one that is uh, going to be doing anything down here in South Carolina. Lots of questions we can't even get to, the impact on native flora and fauna, if there's any novel hosts. You know, we've got a lot of tree species down here that the Asian longhorn beetle has not run into in Ohio and some of those northern ones. And then the economic impact. Uh, maple, from a commercial forestry perspective, maple is not a huge resource down here. Uh, maybe one to two percent of the forest, but it's, you know, much more common in kind of those bottomland wetter areas. Uh, it's not a big commercial timber species. A lot of foresters will anecdotally tell you, you know, hey, what do you think about ALB and the maple? You'll get a sh shoulder shrug and just kind of meh, whatever. Um, but maple is very common in these wet areas, especially in the swampy areas. If there's a if there's a mound of dirt big enough to stick out of the ground, it'll it'll have a maple growing on it. So very, very common. And then diverse property ownership is something we work with and we deal with quite a bit as well. It is one of our management challenges. 
I've circled the, the infestation zone here. And you can see it is surrounded by suburbs, island communities, small towns and blue collared areas, and then rural. So we've got four very different segments of the population all right there. Uh, it takes a little bit of different communication to deal with each one of those. And that has been one of the challenges too, is making sure we can reach all these folks in the way that is most efficient. And, um, you know, frankly, most, uh, most um, you know, getting us the most uh, bang for our buck, so to speak, to reach them. So can we eradicate this Asian longhorn beetle spot? Will it be hard? Do we try anyway? This is absolutely yes to all three of these things. I think we are in a very good spot. We've had very good success so far. And, um, you know, we're only, we're not even two years in yet, but at this point, positivity is still brimming from the, uh, from the top for me. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions and thanks for your time, folks. Thank you, David. We have one question here. Um, Francis asks, how have the city and county been to work with on the a ALB issue? This was earlier on in your presentation. She asked, what are some strengths and weaknesses of communication slash, slash collaboration? Yeah, some, some of that I can answer. Some of that is better um, answered by some of our regulatory folks, but I think overall, everyone has been very good to work with. And I think everybody did a good job from our side early on uh, getting across the importance of the issue, why we need to do this, how we're going to do this, and when we're going to do this. And, um, you know, it's just everyone has been pretty good. There have been some hiccups, don't get me wrong. And honestly, I'm probably not the one to talk with about that. That's something maybe for Ms. Kim Dean, who is our APHIS ALB lead down here, or Ms. Haley Ritger. She's our DPI program lead for Asian longhorn beetle. But overall, they've been very good to work with and very understanding. And, and it's been a very much a collaborative process. OK. Um, Haley did come on and say that she was available. Um, she came on the chat and said she was available for questions yeah. regarding the regulatory and eradication program, folks. Um, so if you see that in the chat. Um, is there any other questions? Because at this point, we don't have any more. Oh, wait. Oh, it says, Jeff Harris says, this was an excellent presentation. I would love to work on the front lines like you have. Wonderful research being done here in South Carolina. Hopefully, we can be ready when it gets to Indiana. Just no, we don't want it in Indiana. We don't want it in Michigan. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that, yeah. Was to you. that was Jeff to you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And it is, it is, um, it's almost surreal to be on the front lines like this, you know, and I, and I put that picture up earlier of me sitting there with the adult beverage watching the kids burn stuff, not as a joke, that really was how I spent most of the afternoons during early COVID. And it's just, it's not something that you think about happening. And when it does, it is an absolute whirlwind um, of, of everything because everything has to be done immediately. Um, you know, I went from having really no research program. My appointment at Clemson is 100% extension. So I went from basically no research program to a full research program in a course of 18 months. Um, so life comes at you fast, I guess is the, the um, long story short there. And, and I wish I could say that it's probably never going to go anywhere else, but I don't think that's true. I think uh, people as a whole make poor choices. And I, I fully believe that Asian longhorn beetle will turn up somewhere else. It's just a matter of where and when. So I, I wish I could say otherwise, but I just don't have enough faith in my fellow human to believe that it won't get transported. Okay, thank you. Kevin Dodd says, great talk, Dave. Are, you all are doing a lot of interesting work. Have you tried any other treatments for suppression cuts? We have been putting a groove along the link of downed SPB infested trees in New York to increase water saturation and freezing in the tree to pop off the bark and hopefully increase brood mortality. I was I wonder if something like that could be working working for you to increase moisture in the downed wood. Yeah, good question, Kevin. Thanks, man. Um, I gotta be honest, I don't think we really need to do that. That stuff gets so wet once it gets on the ground. Um, even after six months, bark has just fallen off because there's so much fungus growing on it underneath there. One of the big questions with the cut tree method is timing though. Uh, we cut ours in May and understanding that 
you know, probably most ALB down here are going to be ovipositing in May and June. So I think, you know, in a perfect world, we probably would have cut those things about a month later so that they maybe had eggs in there. Um, because I, I don't think those would be able to develop fast enough. You know, one of the things we talked about is when to cut. If you cut a tree in, let's say, December, January, February, that larva in there is probably big enough to where it can just develop even before the fungus gets to it. So I think a winter cut down here is not going to do a whole lot. And our thinking was that if we could cut them late spring, early summer, when they would have the bulk of the really hot months and hot, moist, wet months down here to really rot, that is probably going to give us our best bet. Now, we haven't tested the other timelines yet, but that's kind of our thinking at this point. Uh, definitely no shortage of moisture. Um, I think it's a different environment up there for sure. Um, and, you know, we were out in February and bark was just, you know, had already fallen off on its own. Everything was so, so decomposed. So pretty optimistic that that something there is going to work, we hope. All right. Um, Lee Greenwood says, have you considered breeding an army of woodpeckers? Um, joking aside, what native predators are using this larvae as a food source? Uh, Lee, uh, I have not considered breeding birds, but maybe there are people out there that would. We don't really know what native predators we have here. I mean, yeah, we see the woodpeckers out there, but I don't think, you know, that's one of those interesting questions that I don't know that we'll really get to. We're hoping to get a little bit of it with some of Marina's work. You know, we're going to cut down uh, infested trees and try to see what's in there, but we have not done any work really on native predators, and I couldn't even begin to tell you if, if we have high woodpecker populations or whatever around here. I, I honestly don't know. All right, thank you. Um, Elizabeth asks, do you have any long-term plans to replant the areas where trees have been removed? What's being involved in, what's been involved in the planning? Yeah, we've been trying to get some trees for residents. Um, you know, we, we're trying to get some trees to give back to residents to replant. Some of these areas that are hit are, you know, this, this area in general is undergoing a lot of development. So some of these areas that are being in, infested and impacted, you know, one's going to be a future golf course, one's going to be, you know, probably have a housing development. So in some cases, they're just kind of getting plowed over at some point and built on. Um, so not all of the stuff is going to need replanting. In some of the other natural areas where it's going to stay natural, there's honestly enough regeneration and things grow fast enough here that in a couple, three years, you're not even going to know a tree was growing there at one point because there will be another one up there. Uh, that's another one of the benefits, I guess, of being down here in this really uh, long growing season is stuff fills in very, very fast. The big issue that I think about a lot is, well, is it going to be a tree we want or is it going to be invasive? Because we've got a lot of Chinese tallow. There's some some other stuff down here that we don't really want. So the big question is going to be, can we um, put something back in there that we would like versus just, you know, an invasive that's going to come up and take over? Okay. Um, David Williams asks, if ALB really gets out of control across the country, would you predict that companies would be allowed to inject trees with emamectin benzoate without permission? I don't know that I can predict that, but I also just don't think that's going to work very well because of the biology of the pest. You know, the adults may or may not feed, and the larvae just spend so little time on the phloem, your timing for any EB injection would have to be absolutely perfect, and you would have to hope that the larva ate enough phloem to get killed. And I, I don't know that we know if that even works very well yet. Um, that's something that I kind of wanted to do and we just ran out of time and resources. But I think, you know, if, if Emerald Ash Borer has done anything positive, it really improved our tree treatment and tree injection techniques. And it, it, it lent itself to, uh, we got a lot better tree chemicals to use, right? And mectin benzoate being a good one. We got a lot of that stuff, I think, because of Emerald Ash Borer and people trying to get um, treatments for that. So. We know the treatments there. We know it. We know it works in the tree, but we don't know how well it works with ALB yet. And I think you would have to do some real controlled studies to see if that was even going to be a viable treatment alternative before you went any further down that road. All right. Um, Karen Kaluzi asks, what types of regulations 
um, and or enforcements do you have for firewood? Well, they are not supposed to, you know, every state has a different firewood regulation and Lee Greenwood probably is a great one to talk here. Um, and then also Haley, you know, we, you know, from the quarantine perspective, you can't move that stuff out of the quarantine. So if you have a, you know, if you've got an infested tree in your yard and you cut it down, you burn it in your yard, that's fine. But we're not letting, letting that firewood get, get out of, uh, out of that quarantine. Um, yeah, Haley's, Haley's putting some stuff in the chat there as well. So, you know, firewood is one of those things where there generally are regulations about not moving it, but when it comes to enforcement, it's pretty lax, you know, and then people say, well, why don't they just enforce the rules? Well, in the overall scheme of what law enforcement spends their time on, enforcing firewood regulations is so far down the list, it doesn't even register. Uh, so that's that's part of the issue right there is that, you know, there are regulations, you're not supposed to move it place to place, um, but people often don't, it's often not enforced. Unfortunately, you are right. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't see any more questions. Haley's been providing us some good information as well on the chat, folks, if you want to see that. Um, and Lee is as well. Lee runs the National yep, oh, yep, she is there. I see Firewood that Program. So if you want firewood information, Lee Greenwood is your person. Yes. All right. We got one more minute. Oh, it says... Oh, she's saying it's illegal in South Carolina to move any articles that may harbor ALB. I know re re Lee recently put up together a report on all the regulations for firewood specifically. Okay. Oh, we have a question here. Um, Elizabeth says, since maples aren't economically important in your area, what arguments have you found most persuasive in convincing people that eradication efforts are necessary? I'll sometimes talk about maple syrup. Yeah, we don't have that. That's not an option down here either. Um, you know, we, the people we have, I guess, needed to convince have been homeowners. And, um, you know, we, we just kind of come at it. This is a federally regulated thing. We can, one of the things I tend to say is, look, we know it hits maples, but it might hit other stuff too. So we're trying to get rid of it as soon as we can. So it doesn't spread and cause more havoc. Um, I haven't really dealt with a lot of large landowners that have had any problem with it, primarily because the amount of maple they lose is so little. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not, I'm going to be honest, it's not pine. And that's what drives the forestry community down here in the forest economy is pines. And uh, it doesn't hit pine. So when you tell people you need to cut down the maples on this hundred acres, they're generally like, yeah, okay, fine, whatever. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the, the, I guess, silver lining of this is pine is what drives the forestry community down here. So when you talk about something like a maple, they just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, do what you got to do. Okay. Um, Sarah Cotter has a comment um, kind of um, focused toward Lee. Um, she says, I've worked on ALB in Ohio for the past eight years, and we very often observe lots of feeding activity in highly infested areas by several woodpecker species, evidenced in, see in seeing a lot of woodpecker damage and plenty of sightings. I'd love to see numbers of species population increases. But yes, I'd say the woodpeckers are out there on the front lines with us. Yeah, and I mean, I'm going to be honest, I didn't really pay attention last year. Woodpeckers was kind of the last thing on my mind. So I'll keep an eye out this year. Um, I'm also not that fluent in birds, so a lot of them look the same to me. So unfortunately, I'm probably not the guy to answer some of these questions. You need someone more bird inclined than I am. Okay. All right, folks, it looks like we've kind of come to the end of the question and answer. Um, and I think we will let that go. If, uh, if there's any other questions that you want to direct to David, his information is there on the screen as well. You will be getting the email tomorrow, which will provide um, his contact info and other information you need if you would like to get CEUs for watching this live webinar. David, thank you so much for doing this. This is really helpful for us to keep up on this and, and keep ALB in, the, in our, you know, 
in our sights and awareness, like you say, is everything. So um, I, uh, I'm so happy you were able to share this with us and thanks everyone for participating. I'm going to be ending the webinar now, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you again, David. Thanks, everybody.